And hello, WonderCon at home guests. Or hello. Visitors, guests, who do you think everyone is? Man, now that I'm on camera. Co-conspirators? <laughs> I'm not sure. Um, and now that we're here, I'm like on camera, you and I have been talking for a minute already. I'm noticing how much I'm like touching my face. So it's a good thing we're not all meeting in person. It's okay. <laughs> as long as you're not touching my face, I think we'll be cool. Um, so hi. <laughs> uh, anyone watching? Hi. Uh, <laughs> I am Peter Kleins. I am the author of 14, Terminus, uh, Dead Moon, Paradox Bound, The Fold, The Ex-Heroes books, a uh, Robinson Crusoe mashup novel, very, very few have ever read or listened to, uh, a short story collection, a bunch of screenplays that never got produced. Um, and I am here with... I'm Ray Porter, uh, and I'm coming from the virtual background of my favorite pub in England. Uh, I am the narrator of the audiobooks of 14, The Fold, Dead Moon, Terminus, um, the short story collection, Dead Men Can't Complain, mm -hmm. uh, and a few other audiobooks. Um, almost 400, audio. yeah, almost 400 now. Uh, on Audible and um, actor, um, stage, screen, and television. Pretty much. And very happy to be here. That was actually funny. Funny thing. I know I've mentioned this to other people that the first thing I knew you from when they they said, "Oh, we, you're going to be with, working with Ray Porter," was I went and looked you up and I was, "Oh my God, he's that guy from the Little Lost short." It. <laughs> <laughs> wow! Really? And that, and that oh, was wow. the, that was the very first thing. Because whenever I like, get an error, I, I run to IMDb and I'm like, do I know them from something? Sure. Do I? And yeah. that was something immediately. It's like, oh my God, they got that guy. <laughs> that little short was very funny. I was happy to book it, obviously. Um, they sent a limo to the house, drove me to the airport, first class to Hawaii, beautiful hotel room in Waikiki, and we shot it in a warehouse. <laughs> and I remember thinking, we, we couldn't do this in Burbank? Um, but I was glad for the trip to Hawaii. So oh, yeah. nice. <laughs> that was fun. Um, so anyway, God, we have, I know we got a bunch of questions from people Yes. Um, uh, from our studio audience here. I love all your cosplay. I'm so happy some of you dressed up for this. Um, <laughs> we can, <laughs> yes. Yeah. That's squail in row three. You're really, that's amazing. Yeah. I love how that that's really phenomenal. Are those like like wires, like a Muppet? How does he do that? Uh, yeah, I mean, it's just incredible. It's, it's amazing <laughs> what an air conditioner, hot glue, and a song in your heart can achieve. It, some of these people are truly amazing. <clears throat> yeah. um, so Actually, I live in any, any of the cons I've ever been to. I am absolutely in awe of a lot of the cosplay that I see. You know, that, that, that's so much work and time and expense and everything else. <clears throat> goes into these things that'll be seen, you know, at the con. Yeah. I, I'm, I'm accustomed to the film world where, you know, obviously it's going to be out there, but uh, to see these works of art that people have built for the con, it's just, it's really impressive. I can actually, barely dress myself. It's actually, it's sad because we, as we're recording this, um, they just announced they're canceling San Diego. I know. Con. Yeah. I heard. And, one thing I saw and I had, it had not even occurred to me was the number of people who've been working on yeah. cosplay outfits all along. And I said, that you know, was like, my first thought. Yeah. yeah the, just people like, Oh my God. Like, yeah, I'm thinking selfishly. I thought of me, I thought, Oh, this panel isn't going to happen. This isn't going to happen. And then I saw a couple of people come and I said, Oh, holy crap. I never even thought of that. They're like, it's not just publishers. Like there are fans who put in months of work. Yeah. For this and i really i really think that like maybe for one day of comic-con they should just go okay it's 2020 yeah and then the next day they'll be like all right now it's 2021 you know Honestly, i think it'd be super cool and i'll just toss this out here if anyone from wondercon is listening just do a, a wondercon slideshow and let people send in pictures of some of these awesome costumes. absolutely that would be amazing yeah i think that would be great or, or here's my one minute video and you can clip out the 30 seconds of it 20 seconds of it you like whatever but yeah there's i remember absolutely last year, that's a brilliant idea yeah last last year at wondercon i remember i saw an amazing if if you happen to be watching this i saw an amazing dr octopus 
this guy did the the Alfred Molina Dr. Octopus from the movie, Ooh. and he had a full set of tentacles that must have been like 10, 15 feet. It was gigantic, but he looked amazing. And ah, that's so <laughs> cool. So. Yeah, that's to me, that's one of the most entertaining things about the cons is seeing what people have created. So yeah, I agree with you. I think yes, WonderCon people, please. <clears throat> Let's have a let's have a remote montage of the creativity of of the of the attendees. Definitely. Yeah. Um, I also. So we've got some questions here. We have questions. I was actually going to tell you now, just to to make people further upset. Um, one thing I had two things planned for if we got to do this in person. One was mm. sort of like, it's something you and I have talked about. As as many of my fans know, I'm actually a huge Lego fan. And I know you yes. are a car, and you are a big car fan, and I am. And as we have talked about once or twice, you and I between us, they made that gorgeous Mustang model. Yeah, I was actually yeah. going to be giving it to you at WonderCon right now. What for the audience? Yeah, oh. um, I've got a twelve-year-old boy in the other room who I'm not going to tell him this. Don't, because I because I figured it would. I figured like he'd probably be there. You'd talk about bringing him and we'd be like, oh, big happy moment for everyone. Oh. I, I can mail it. To I you. love, I, I can... love Lego. <laughs> uh, it, it's, I, I do. I mean, it's, it's phenomenal to me. This is a question I have, and it may be kind of an existential question. If anybody wants to chime in on this, uh, please do. But where, where do the Legos go? Like when you know how there. when you're moving and you move the fridge and there's like, there's, there's a Lego brick and you know, I, where where do they all go? Is there an island of Legos that have just vanished from people's lives and then they sort of are recycled and come back into their lives? Maybe. I saw a thing... Of, I only find them with my bare feet in the middle of the night, typically. I saw a thing a while back that there are apparently enough Legos, they have made enough Legos over time that there's something like 300 Lego bricks for every person on Earth. Yeah, yeah, that's, yeah. I think it was... Um, James May from, uh, from Top Gear and from the Grand Tour did a series called Toy Stories where he built an entire full-size livable house out of Lego. And he talked about the history of Lego and, and oh, if, you've, if you haven't seen it, you should look it up. It's brilliant. No, I'm gonna look it up. That sounds fascinating. Yeah. There's, I did yeah. a, I was watching the toys that made us and they just talked about some amazing things I never realized. I, I'm a hardcore Lego fan for a yeah. long time, but there was stuff about it. I oh, I know that about you. Yes. Um, yeah. The other thing I was going to do, which was a, a fun total cheat, was um, as you and I have talked about before, you are kind of in, you, you kind of cold read when you do this. You'll give like something a quick look. Very much so, yeah. Yeah. So what I was going to do was bring like the first five, six pages from the thing I'm working on now. Um, oh, and cool. Read them to the audience. Um, but that's not going to happen either. And I, I, I thought about doing it now, like actually sending them to you. Yeah. And I thought like, okay, but then that'll be this whole thing of me just sort of sitting here, like, like you reading and me just sort of like, doo, 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 I think it would be more fun to be in a room with everybody. Yeah. Too. Well, that's no, it. it's, it's, the, yeah. This is really cool. And I'm glad we get to do it. But there yeah. is that little difference of, I agree. Yeah. I agree. Cause I actually read, uh, last year at, or two years ago now at Dragon Con, I read the first chapter of Terminus. To a girl. Oh, I had a reading and I did the first chapter of Murdoch on the beach watching Anne give her a sermon, and yeah, uh, like got very positive response from everybody. But I remember telling them all like, so like in year and a half, you're gonna get to hear Ray Porter read all of this better, and. <laughs> <laughs> Well, so, all right, so next year, we'll put a pin in it, and next year, I'll read whatever you put in front of me at WonderCon, looking at everybody's amazing outfits and costumes and co cosplays, and yes, we'll do that. that. That sounds great, and I think every, anybody watching this, remind us, we are going to do this. Yes. Ray will read the first five, six, we'll, we'll probably time it out at least at whatever of whatever you're of whatever you're yeah. writing at the time i mean it might be you know it might be a grocery list of yours if you mm -hmm. haven't written anything so we'll just Here, see but and now an overdue letter to my mother 
read by Ray Porter. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, exactly. Hi, mom. Sorry. Um, yeah. Should we do these? Should we do some of these questions? They're really yeah. good questions. Um, I will tell you that uh, this first question that I have for you, Peter, um, I'm looking forward to hearing the answer because I have no idea what this is. Okay. And, and that may offend some, some con attendees, and I apologize. I, I, I'm woefully uneducated on certain things. Okay. This, is, uh, this is from Thomas, and the question is, what about Rom Space Night makes it one of your favorites? And it's a two-part question. Okay. That's the first one. What about Rom Space Night makes it one of your favorites? And what is the largest Lego set you have put together? Okay, well, I can answer that one first. That's probably easier. <laughs> um, it's <laughs> probably the largest one. Okay, sad truth. I have a ton of like the big master sets, um, but I've just never had time to build them. Um, my partner for a couple of years got them for me as like launch gifts that we would go to the Lego store. And so I have like a like the giant Lego haunted house and the Parisian restaurant and the detective's office. And we actually just got the Lego bookstore for the Terminus release. Um, she got me the big Lego. So cool. Yep. She got me the Lego Voltron for Christmas last year. You know, um, they're all cool. sitting in the, they're all sitting in the closet stacked up and <laughs> built still in the box. Cause the two part thing being one, uh, I know if I get them out, cause we, I don't know if anyone's noticed in the background here, we have five cats. So I have to be very careful oh. like what stage I leave things in for a halfway point or I will wake up and like you were saying, Legos have vanished. Huh? <laughs> just a side, just a sidebar. I read a, I read a tweet, you know, I, I live <clears throat> a couple of miles away from JPL mm -hmm. and I'm a, massive like NASA fan and all of that read a tweet from somebody at JPL who said now that they're working from home they actually had to discuss in a meeting how they can avoid having cats accidentally command spacecraft <laughs> oh my god I never thought of that yeah like, like it's embarrassing when a cat runs across my keyboard but <laughs> right but when when Cassini is hurtling towards the sun because the cat, you know, <laughs> I, I laughed. Okay, a we lot. have 30 seconds to get this right, everyone. Timing is no. <laughs> um, yeah. So, yeah, the biggest one I've probably actually put together, uh, I had both of the old classic pirate ships. I'm not sure which one is bigger. I know they just re released uh, one of them, but I had the first pirate ship, um, and I'm totally blanking on the name right now, but the one with the red and white sails. And then I had the second one which had, I mean, I have all the pirate ships they've made, but and then the second one uh, with the black and white kind of tattered, more ghostly sails. Um, so whichever one of those is the bigger one, that is probably the biggest Lego set I've ever built. Um, as far as Rom Space Knight goes, um, it's a character I loved as a kid. Um, I'm very, it, it just sort of hit a lot of notes for me. It's sci-fi, it's sorcery, it's got a good noble character. It hits lots and lots of heroic beats. Um, I got to, I picked up a bunch of older issues lately. I, I have, I had the whole collection, gave it up at one point, got it again, like four or five years ago at New York Comic Con, um, which I, I don't recommend not going to New York Comic Con, but don't pick up the whole run of something at a con because then you're lugging around a lot of paper, like four reams. <laughs> For wow. the rest of the <laughs> one, um, or at least that day. Uh, but I reread them and I realized how many parts of it I really love that these are definitely simplistic 70s, early 80s stories for kids, but there's a lot of nice subtlety in it. And there's a lot of stuff about, you know, how would you, uh, you know, I don't know. It's It's just, it was an amazing story. The idea of this misunderstood, you know, super knight from space coming down to try and save Earth from these alien invaders. So it's kind of part, you know, hidden creatures, suspense, body snatchers sort of thing. Um, and I just really liked it. And then IDW redid the comics 
uh, or didn't redo it, but they did a whole new take on it that uh, Christos Gage and Chris Royale wrote, and they did amazing things with it. Like they sort of started over from scratch um, and said, hey, you know, what if we did this? What if we did this? And they introduced new characters and a new take, and their take on it was awesome. They did fantastic things. And I, and I have basically told folks at IDW, I have actually sat down with them and said, so look, if you need someone else to take over at some point, you know, <laughs> right here, I would do it. I have ideas. I have lots of thoughts. I have my six month plan, my one year plan. <laughs> um, and I pitched some stuff to them and then, you know, society collapsed. So yeah, as it does. Um, that was my long question. Let me, let me dig through. Good one. Things. Thank you. Um, trying to keep stuff under control. Let me get a question for you. Uh, actually, I've got a question for okay. from Saria, uh, who I think is sitting over there in the back. Uh, Hi, Saria. <laughs> uh, Saria wants to know, what was the first book you and Peter did together? Uh, and how were you first introduced? The first book was 14. Um, and I hadn't met, I hadn't met, Peter yet at that time I was contacted by the producer of the audiobook who said and I think I've told you this story before Peter who said <clears throat> I've got this really weird I don't know slacker sci-fi horror thing um I'm not sure what to do with it and I was like uh, yes please I'll have that um not knowing anything about it and uh started recording i recorded from home um and just you know fell in love with the book immediately and then you and i didn't meet until sometime after the release of the audiobook we were at a book signing in burbank jonathan mayberry's book signing in burbank at was a, when you and i first met at dark delicacies i believe at dark delicacies yeah. it was for one of his joe ledger books and uh, and uh and I went, and that was where you and I first actually met. Right. Um, so that was sometime long after the thing. And that's, I you know, that's the thing it's narrated. Like, I think we had done two or three books at that point. I know you and I didn't meet for a while. I had thought, we? Maybe. I think. Were we in, were, we weren't into like the fold at that point, were I think we? We were. I think the fold had come out oh, just before okay. we met. Maybe it did. Yeah. But that's sort of, you know, that's, that's sort of the nature of it with, with narrating audiobooks. I mean, rarely do you get to, I mean, I've been very fortunate in that I've gotten to know you and I've gotten to know Jonathan Mayberry and a couple of other authors that I've worked with, but typically, you know, we're, we're sat here in our booth in the dark and, and we don't, you know, um, and there's, you know, th there's not a, um, Typically, you know, I, I just do the book that I'm, I'm asked to do. Like a producer will say, hey, we've got this book. We'd like you to do it. Yes, please. Because I enjoy eating and paying rent. Um, so do I. And, hey. well, it's, it's kind of a funny thing about me. Um, but so you never really know, you know, going in. And, uh, the, yeah, a few pages into 14, I was like, ah, oh, this is going to be fun. Good. So. I I still think you are a huge part of the reason 14 became so popular that if that's true, then I'm very proud of that. I thank mean, you. Well, thank you. Yeah. Happy, happy to help. So you've got a bunch of <clears throat> the questions I have for you are all multi-part questions. Okay. You so can, you can decide how much of the multi-part you want to do. Oh no, let's, you know, let's give well, we them. Are on, you know. We are on a time limit here. We don't want to go too crazy. Oh, that's true. Okay. Well, I'll try to ask the questions quickly and maybe you can condense them. I'm going to read you all three. Okay. This is from Jeremy. Okay. Um, one, do you have a goal set for how many books you want to write in your lifetime? Are you ever scared of running out of ideas? Do writers critique other writers' books or can you just enjoy them as a fan? Okay, that's kind of easy because the first two kind of lumped together on that. And okay. I'm pretty sure I, and I'm pretty sure I know who this Jeremy is asking this question. Um, honestly, no. I mean, right now I have, I have at least five books that I would like to write right now um, without 
going into too much. I have, I'm finishing up the book I'm working on now, hoping to have it done like in the next month or so. Uh, then I have a sort of historical horror, weird Western period thing. I don't know, cool. it doesn't, doesn't quite fit any of those genres, but that's what I probably closest to. Um, Dibs. Yep. Yeah. <laughs> um, I have a like a werewolf story that has been bouncing around in my head recently, a vampire story that's been bouncing around in my head for ages. Um, and then, like I said, I have some comic book ideas. I have other short story ideas. There's a hopefully some things might be happening and I might actually get to do a 6X Heroes book. Um, so like, yeah, right cool. now, I'm looking at easily through 2025. I would have no problem writing nonstop through then. And I'm fingers crossed I'll have another idea between now and then. Um, Cause that's usually how it goes that you just get this random inspiration for stuff. Um, as far as critiquing other writers, I mean, I, I never like sit down and pick up a book and seeing, let's see if so-and-so did this right. Um, but I love being able to to read a book, to listen to a book. And it's it's a lot like when I was in the film industry, when you can go see a movie and not think about any technical aspect of it. Yeah. And when I read a book and I get so caught up in it that I that I do not think at all about how they worded that, how they phrased that, or if not, if there will be something that like just is so perfect that like someone you know a turn of phrase or something and you're just like oh that's such a cool way to describe that or do that um but i generally consider if i if i'm not thinking about technical stuff at all when i go when i'm reading a book i think that's a great thing um so and i'm yeah. i i read a lot of books so i get that a lot so <laughs> that's very cool um, did that cover it? Did that answer it, Jeremy? Okay, good. Hope Glad so. to hear. He's nodding yeah. yes there in the yeah. fifth row. <clears throat> yes. Here at WonderCon. Um, yes. Um, I'm, cosplay I'm cosplaying an English pub. You're doing an amazing job. In my background. Too. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Another point, mate. Right, um, <laughs> I've got a question for you, if you like. Yeah. Sure. Um, this one is from David. Who Hi, David. I, I think David is wearing the Batman costume. Right over there. Really nice one. Thank you. <laughs> uh, David would like to know, uh, what's the process like for developing a character's voice for the audiobooks? That varies from character to character, from author to author. Um, there are some, there are some authors that, this sounds really esoteric and weird, but there are some <laughs> authors that, um, I just instantly know what they're going to sound like. I can see their face in my mind. And when I see their face, um, <clears throat> there's no other way their voice could be. Some authors or some characters. And then there's, huh? Some authors or some characters? Some authors and some characters. Okay. I mean, some authors, you know, will write characters and just the, the minute their dialogue comes up, I'm like, oh, right. That's what they sound like. Mm -hmm. Um you know, like I'm hearing it for the first time too. Um, and then there are some others where I have to like, I have to like mess around a little bit and try to kind of find what's going to be the most expressive one. I mean, I will say <clears throat> when you have, when you have a character, like, you know, I, I did a book that had a demon in it and the author very specifically said very guttural sounding voice, like gravel in a, you know, and it's like, okay, <clears throat> there's my vocal instruction. Now, how do I do it in such a way that I'll have a voice by the end of this book? Because you can actually hurt yourself. Um, so that requires some finessing and some tweaking, you know, and, um, you know, ultimately, whatever voice is chosen for whatever character, if it doesn't serve the story, then it's useless. I have one job. And that is to convey what the author has written to the person listening. And anytime I feel myself getting in the way of that conduit, uh, I know I have to change uh, tactics. 
Can I, so. can I ask you a follow-up question to that? Sure. That's something you were saying? Um, yeah. How hard is it for you as the narrator, like, okay, I'm, I'm going to be totally spoiled and use one of my own books as an example, that we have, say, a character like Harry, who's right. a tough female character, yeah, and then who you will voice in a certain way, and then going to a character like, say, Agent 15, who is, A, this very coarse, gruff character, who also yeah. you're kind of doubly muffling yourself because uh, for anyone who hasn't read the book, 15 does not have a face. Um, and it's one of my favorite <laughs> books ever, by the way. Just Thank as you. a reader, I love that book. Thank you very much. Um, but how, like, how physically rough is, you, is that on you to go from like, you know, this character to that character, back and forth and back and forth. I have, you know, I have, I have actor friends uh, and non-actor friends too, who, who I think secretly think my job is the easiest job in the world. You know, it's like, you get to sit alone and read books all day out loud. That sounds great. I would love to do that. And it's like, <laughs> okay. Um, because I can tell you, you get to the end of the day and your brain is mush. Uh, all of this musculature is utterly exhausted. It's just shot. Um, it's very, very tiring. It's very, very hard. It's very challenging. Finding the voice for 15 was absolutely a challenge because just from an audio standpoint, it wouldn't do for me to talk like this, you know, with my hand in front of, I mean, that's not going to work. So what do you do? And I discovered, as is usually the case, it's less about what sort of physical bells and whistles you can put on it, and it's more about character. So for me, the, the soul of that particular character in that book was not so much that he lacks a face, it's that he lacks empathy, he lacks any awareness, uh, I don't know if any of you have ever been on the phone with like, let's say the phone company or something like that. And you, and you're talking to that person and you know, they don't care about your problem. They don't care about your plight. And the emptiest thing in the world is that phrase. Well, we're very sorry for your inconvenience. There's just nothing more desolate. Oh my God. That's, it's so funny. Cause I was, when I have listened to your performance for Paradox Bound and that is it exactly like every word he yeah. says has that sort of emptiness to it. <laughs> it's this boilerplate, I'm supposed to say this thing. I want to give the illusion that I care, you know? And uh, that to me, that to me was the real horror of that character. That was the most frightening thing about that character was that he shows up looking the way he does, being the way he is, but he's got this, you know, we're terribly sorry for any inconvenience kind of thing. That, uh, you know. That that was the hope with the faceless men to make their their politeness be incredibly creepy. That's exactly it. Yeah, mm -hmm. you know. And I mean, I take my cues from the author. I took my cues from you as to like, wow, what's the character choice I can make here? And you know, and fortunately, uh, as a writer, you you really you know infuse those characters with life. So uh, in many ways, it was kind of easy. But it, yeah, I remember I spent a good long time trying to figure out that sound. We recorded that in a studio in London. So some poor English engineer had to sit there while I'm going, mur, 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 you know, and just trying different voice things until I figured it out. It's a lot easier when I record on my own because I'm the only one embarrassed by me. Actually, I, I well, you know what? As, do you have another question? And then I, I have another person. I do. I do. I have uh, from Jeff. Uh, have you written parts specifically with Ray's Thank you. With Ray's <laughs> talents in mind, do you ever discuss story elements, character direction with Ray prior to recording to ensure the narrator gets it? Um, not, not to be heartbreaking to you or anything, but I actually rarely think of Ray when I'm writing. Every now and then, I will, I will hit something and realize, you know, oh, he's going to have fun with this or he'll have fun with that. But I mean, I've never sat down and sat down and written for Ray. Um, Given your books, please don't think of me when you're writing. 
I think probably the biggest thing is, <laughs> is as we've joked, there is an Easter egg in in Paradox Bound that was specifically for Ray. Oh yeah, and that was. No, I don't think anybody else in the world got it. So I screamed <laughs> so loudly they thought I was having an attack. Um, but and that was a cat jumping by for anyone who caught that. There you go. Connection. Um. Uh. Crap, my mind just went blank on the question for a second. Um, so it was, it was, you know, do you write stuff specifically with yes. me in mind? And then do you ever discuss with me story elements and character direction prior to me recording to make I sure will, I get it? I will say that doing uh, two back-to-back -back books with Audible, uh, Dead Moon and Terminus, uh, my editor, Steve at Audible, made me a lot more conscious of the idea that a book will be narrated rather than read, if that makes sense, that he would point out little phrases where it's like, you know, when someone reads this, it may sound like that, you know, or- Oh, wow. thank you, Steve. Yeah, or this, you know, that this yeah. will, um, this will happen. I'm trying to think of like a couple of the, of the notes he's giving, because he would just point out little things. It was like, I never would have thought of that. Um, like one thing I know, uh, I've talked with other people about this before. I'm a big believer um, as, someone, as, a, as a person who writes on the page, set is invisible. I know when I started out as a writer, um, I tried to do like 1000, I would use different dialogue descriptors all the time that I would have characters would say, but they would also speak, they would intone, they would, gasp, they would whisper, they would grumble, they would, you know, all this sort of stuff. And one of the first times I ever got to sit down with an editor, he was like, look, set is invisible. People are just going to gloss over set on the page. Don't worry about it. And that is 100% true. The problem is in an audio book, set gets really annoying fast. That it becomes like cowbell. I know for some listeners, it really does. That it's he said, she said, Bob said, Mary said, Doug said, and it's like, oh my God. Um, so I got much more conscious of how much dialogue can I have, like, can I make the voices strong enough that you, that you as the narrator or someone as the reader can look at this and immediately go, this is this person talking, this is that yeah. person talking. Yeah. Um, and then knowing that, can I get rid of dialogue tags here? Um, so that is my answer to all that. As far as collaborating beforehand the only thing that comes up is that one time i i mentioned the sinjin saint john thing to you yes um which which i then got you in trouble for <laughs> yes you um, did. <laughs> basically, uh, if, if any of you in our studio audience uh would like to pick up there's a short story collection dead men can't complain and there's a story called skin trade um and at one point one of the characters references uh, a character named Sinjin St. John. Now, Sinjin, this was a, a sort of a character I came up with years ago and I decided it would be fun to drop it in to the short story. Sinjin is spelled St. John. Yes. And so when Ray was recording, I shot him a little note on, on Twitter or Facebook or something saying, yeah. by the way, just as a reminder, St. John as a first name is pronounced Sinjin. And he was like, oh, okay, that's right. And Ray went off and recorded it and then with you were recording at home because then you got notes back that you pronounced. Yes, I was recording at home. And when the QC came back, they were like, this is mispronounced. And I had to write back to them and go, no, 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 no. The author wants this, he said. Yep. And then I had to get, and then I had to go, I'm like, I'm so sorry. I should have made the note to you as well. Because I only told the narrator, not the, you know, yeah. producers working on it. So, I mean, I will say that, like, because I know you, you know, when when I'm about to start one of your books, I will maybe not even specific questions, but I will say, is there anything you want me to know? Is there anything in particular, you know, but uh, you don't get the luxury of doing that with a lot of authors. So, I mean, honestly, we I don't even think we like I said, we we met in person, I think, after the fold. And I don't think. Man, I'm not even sure like when even online or with his messages. Yeah. When we first communicated about how yeah. would this be done, how would this go over? Yeah. So. Yeah. Um, yeah. Let me let me ask you that follow-up question I had, or not really follow-up, but I guess a tie-in question. Mm -hmm. Um, because you are kind of cold reading when you go through a book, if you sit down 
with a book from me, with a book from Jonathan Mabry, Scott Sigler, uh, uh, yeah, any of any of the many people you read for. Um, weird as this may sound, how much of it do you retain? Like when you very down- little, <clears throat> very little, um, uh, which has which can come back and bite you later. Um, because oftentimes when you're narrating a book and it's a series or when you're narrating a book and a character from that book four years ago reappears in a new book, you have to remember what they sound like. Um, and I don't keep an audio library of everybody's voices. And I certainly don't keep a lot of my own audio books around because that would be gross and weird. Um, so, you know, trying to maintain continuity uh, is is really really tough. Now, there are parts of fourteen that I remember because I loved them. So, as a reader, just like when you've read a book and there's that thing you remember from that book, same for me. Um, Paradox Bound, I remember a lot more of because I really really enjoyed. You know, for some reason, it just like that just did it for me. I love that book. It's a car. Um, it's well. It, 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 Yes, but it's there's there, it just it hits a lot of it hits a lot of my taste buds. I like that book a lot because of that. Um, as far as retaining it, no, and the same is true. I mean, when I was doing Shakespeare, you know, you you work and work and work to learn all these lines, and you do the play, you know, 120 performances or something like that. About a week and a half after the show's closed, if you ask me what my lines were, I couldn't tell you. Um, there's a there's a sort of a temporary folder in your brain that that stuff goes into, and it's there and it's present because it needs to be, but it's work. Um, so no, I, I typically don't retain a lot of it, and that doesn't have anything to do with my sort of uh, rather than cold reading, let's say fresh approach. Okay. Um, no, but um, cold reading's fine. That doesn't have anything to do necessarily with my style or the choices that I make as a narrator with process. And just for those of you listening, if you're going, what do you mean cold reading? Um, I, had, I had said to Peter, and this is true, I'm not somebody who sits down and reads the entire book and examines every little thing before I record it. I learned the hard way that if I do that, my narration will be very uh, dry and very second time through kind of thing. And I found it's much more immediate and much more fun for the listener if we are experiencing the book together. So I try to keep things as fresh as I possibly can. What that means is I'll go through the book lightly before I record it, but I'm not hammering anything down. I want to be uh, as shocked by something in the book as the listener is ultimately for me, that helps me make the book a more immediate experience. Other narrators completely different. So, you know, your mileage may vary. Have you ever gotten burned by that or like, sure. Absolutely. I have. Absolutely. I have. I, there's, there's, you know, the famous story of a book that I did where, um, the author left out a lot, you know, in the character description, which is the author's choice per view, you know, artistic license. And I rolled with the voice. I chose this voice. Uh, big, burly, kind of slightly Celtic dialect, uh, monstrous character. And about 70 or 80 pages in discovered that it was a very small, waif-like female character. So I had to go back and redo the voice. Uh. Um, I mean, I may have said a lot of words beginning with F when it happened, and then I went back and fixed it. You know, you, it's just what you have to do. So, but yes, it has, it has bitten me before, for sure. For sure. Um, from Abyss. Okay. We're going to look into the Abyss, and the Abyss is going to look back at us. Can you write down a sound that a squail would make and then Ray reads it out loud? Well, I mean, we, we technically have done that, haven't we? Uh, uh, yes, and you can order it on Audible. Yes, you can. That's we, we <laughs> squails in 14. Yeah. Um, 
because I I actually have had people parrot those lines back and tell me how how much you like it and it's weird because it's one of those things where I'm I'm super glad I did it in retrospect it's one of those things you know so much I mean 14 was my my fourth published novel yeah if actually completed novel and then we could probably argue numbers past that attempts at a novel um <laughs> and it is one of those things where i know people love it um the book went through a lot of changes while i was writing it it is one of those things where i have wondered sometimes like would it have been better if we never hear them um mm. which is something that comes up in uh you know in uh terminus where some people hear them and other yeah. people don't. Um, yeah. Which I like and I think it's cool and fun and creepy, but it does make you wonder, like, huh, well, how would it have been different if if we did it yeah. better? I will say from from my aspect, um, Abyss, Abyss, um, that to achieve the sound the of the squales. Uh, in in 14 involves me getting right up on the microphone for something that's called proximity effect. And the voice is actually really, really, really quiet. And so trying to recreate it in a more conversational scenario like this one, you're going to be like, um, that doesn't sound good or right. Just don't quit your day job. Yeah. Um, that was one of those where, you know, I mean, going back to that earlier question about choosing voices and that sort of thing. I mean, that was obviously, I spent some serious time trying to figure out what that sounds like uh, and would have hurt myself if I'd had more words to say in that voice. Um, but I also used the capabilities of the microphone um, to advantage to, to achieve it because the voice itself, I, I can't project it without ripping something so it's actually very very quiet so the mic's got to be like right there to do it cool i think we have time for like one more we're supposed to kind of wrap this up oh okay do you want me to shall i ask you one sure if you don't mind sure um uh, from Jason, I've really enjoyed the Threshold series. Here's my question. Peter, have you found the voice of your main protagonists being influenced by knowing Ray will likely read them? Example, when you wrote Mike in The Fold, were you hearing Ray's portrayal of Nate from 14 in your head? I think, yeah, we, we kind of touched on this before. I don't really... Sort of, yeah. Yeah, I don't really uh, think about it at all, about how you're going to perform it. Um, Honestly, a lot of times uh, I listen to stuff and I get surprised hearing you when I finally hear your portrayal of it because you pull out a lot of little things that weren't necessarily in my head. Mm -hmm. Like like in Terminus, for example, mm -hmm. Chase is from Texas and I had a, a Texas voice in my head and it's not the Texas voice you went for, which is not a bad thing. Right at all and i also um like like here's an even better example um the character of veek in 14 um i never imagined veek actually having an accent right that i just figured she spoke you know usual boring american english um and i completely understand the necessity of i have 14 voices to juggle 15 voices whatever well that was more that was more a choice for veek honestly that was more a choice of because veek is so american uh delightfully so but i know a lot of people who are so american whose parents at home speak their native language and so they therefore do have an accent even though they are born and raised in the united states yeah. and, and i'm but that's it and i'm totally cool with it and i know also just the reality of it we need a way to distinguish characters in the audiobook. That yes, yeah. So it was one of those things where it's like, huh? It it caught me off guard <laughs> the first time, but and then funnily enough, you know, getting to write her again when she has popped up in other books, it has never crossed my mind in in my head that she has an accent. Mm -hmm. So right. yeah, I mean, I'm I'm just kind of doing it off independently here in my office and. And I can say performing that character specifically, performing that character specifically, I'm not doing an accent. 
I'm I'm performing the character Veek, yeah. who just happens to speak that way. Uh, if that makes any sense at all, that sounds like a really indulgent BS actor answer, and I wish I'd never said it. But it does, Very-ish. and I, and I think that 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 is a great point. That I mean, nobody has an accent to themselves. No, you know, it's not it's not me that's weird. It's everybody else. Um, mm-hmm. There there was a funny. There's a, I'm going to laugh, and this will be a fun thing to close on. There's a really old Doctor Who episode. I think it's Tom Baker's first episode. And yeah. he is having a discussion with Nicholas Courtney, the Brigadier, about um, this secret Government Powers Act that was acted up, acted on. And they talk about how basically all the nuclear power codes, um, all the superpowers decided that they had this whole plan. And so... Uh, Great Britain was entrusted with all the nuclear power codes for all the countries. And they were like, the whole idea being that whoever did this would, you know, if things got too hot, someone could publish everyone's codes and sort of calm everyone down. No, anyone can do anything. What are you gonna do? What are you gonna do? And he was like, so naturally the one country they trusted was to do this was Great Britain. And the doctor's like, well, of course, everybody else was foreigners. And, <laughs> and, the, journal, and the brigadier was like, exactly. It, <laughs> <laughs> it was one of those things I always laughed at as a kid and then later as an adult I was like okay that's actually twice as funny as I thought it was as a kid yeah but, <laughs> but I Amazing. think it's very true and it's one of those things I, I try to remember as a writer that you know you always hear nobody thinks they're the bad guy you know and also nobody, right. they're the weirdo nobody thinks they're you know the ugly one nobody thinks a lot of people don't think they're the pretty one nobody you know we all sort of see ourselves as the baseline and exactly it, and it affects and that affects how we're going to interact with everyone else well what's what's more chilling a villain who goes i'm a villain or a villain who goes i'm just like you i'm just trying to work this out yeah that to me is way more scary yeah the, because the, that could be me you know those those are always the most fun villains one of the reasons i loved when I finally got my head around Anne for Terminus and realized, you know, this is the whole thing, Anne is 100% convinced she is the hero of the story. Yes. That she's the one who's like, look, you're all kind of nuts, but I'm going to do the right thing. Don't worry. <laughs> so. Yeah. Anyway, um, I think that is our virtual WonderCon panel. Um, what, a, what a treat. This is the point when someone walks in in the back of the room. If you all turn around, you'll see somebody standing there with a little sign. So <laughs> five minutes left. Um, They're in the back of the pub. And yeah. <laughs> last orders. Last orders. Um, thank you, everybody, who's been listening, watching. Thank you so much. Yes. And next year, God willing, we'll all be together in a big room in one celebrating place. this. Probably still slightly apart, just to be safe. But slightly apart. Um, But, you know, in the meantime, I hope that everyone stays safe and well and sane and indoors. Same. Take care, everybody. And thanks for watching. Thank you.